All right, so welcome everybody here. I'm so glad that you are joining us for one of our last lectures of the semester. Um, I know that Professor Yael Aronoff is the director of our Serling Institute, um, and she is on her way. I know that she'll probably give all the announcements for the other lectures um, when uh, after the le this lecture is over. Um, because we always do have a very active um, schedule, but I don't have the dates <laughs> off the top of my head. So we will be two things that I can tell you, which is a undergraduate um, research forum for students who are um, have taken a class in Jewish studies and have done a research project. Um, and it's a really nice, friendly event and opportunity for students to share their research. And we're also having our annual Rabin Brill Lecture, um, again, maybe April 18th. But you can always go to the jsp.msu.edu um, website and, um, and find out the exact date. But we're happy to be welcoming um, another prominent scholar, um, Professor Alexandra Garbarini, um, who is also a colleague, a mutual colleague of ours, um, to talk to us about Holocaust diaries and memory um, for our Holocaust um, Remembrance Day Rabin and Brill lecture in April. So at least two more things going on, and I know there are more. It is my great pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker who has already spent the afternoon speaking with my students in my senior seminar course and um, has published um, a, a variety of really different and interesting um, published on a lot of different and interesting topics. As you can see that today he's going to be talking about his book, The, Hol the Holocaust and the Exile of Yiddish. He's published other books on Yiddish as well, including his first book, the, Ho sorry, the, his first book, The Revolutionary Roots of Modern Yiddish, uh, which came out in 2008. Um, this book um, came out in 2022. And in the middle, he, he wrote about something else, which he was sharing with us in, in our class, um, a book called The United States and the Nazi Holocaust, Race, Refuge, and Remembrance. And that was in 2018. He is uh, the Rubin Presidential Chair of Jewish History and a professor of history at Wake Forest University. And I want to know, like, the presidential chair. It sounds very, very distinguished. <laughs> so we can talk about that later. <laughs> and aside from three impressive volumes, he's also published lots and lots of articles on various topics relating to um, Yiddish and Jewish history and Jewish culture and Israel and Zionism, as well um, as publishing in various uh, sources like AJS Perspectives, Afford, and Tablet, so popular and academic um, um, presses. So he's very busy. He's very um, engaging. And so I'm very, very excited to welcome him here to talk about this book. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. well, thank you so much, Amy. I appreciate this. Um, and I'm really grateful to you for the invitation. Um, you know, I've been sort of in pretty regular conversation over the last year on a range of topics. I'm really grateful for this relationship. And, you know, um, I'm a huge fan of your work uh, as well. And actually, just on, on an introduction that I'm writing, just cited your book for myself. So it's really quite useful for me in my own thinking. Um, I'm also quite grateful to the many sponsors, um, to you all for coming, and Michelle Denage, is that the pronunciation, for doing all the administrative work to make um, the, the talk happen. So um, my, my research on this project goes back uh, a long time ago. My, the first thing I ever published on this, I think, was 2006. This is a project that took many, many years to come into formation. And, I thought when I would, was first going to be writing on this Yiddish language encyclopedia that I was going to be doing a one-off essay and then getting back to, to other work. But soon after I began, I found the story to be so compelling and really utterly unknown by contemporary scholars that I knew that this story just had to be told. And, and I came to understand over time that the history of this encyclopedia was a way to chart the displacement of the Yiddish language and many of its attached political and cultural ideologies away from its physical center in Eastern Europe towards what became an increasingly transnational community of Yiddish speakers. And for me, both as a, a scholar of the Holocaust in Yiddish and uh, as, as a Jew in America, th this 
project of the Edison Encyclopedia stands out in part because it's one of the very few chains of continuity that connect pre-war Europe with post-war America. Nearly every single cultural product that was underway in the, the 1930s in Europe came to an end, you know, uh, in the Jewish world as a consequence uh, of Nazism. This is one of the very, very few that was able to actually continue after the war. So although few people today ever think to consult a physical encyclopedia, and I don't know if there's any in this room here, if so, you know, yeah, they'll be on, on kind of on the bottom shelves, kind of tucked away, let alone purchase an entire set. And while our notion of what comprises an encyclopedia is entirely in flux, thank you, Wikipedia, um, there remains, I think, much to be learned by investigating the encyclopedias of the past. And as transformative as Wikipedia, Google, the new AI platforms, and Internet as a whole have been for our ability to retrieve information and access knowledge, those bound multi-volume encyclopedias that are now relegated to our attics and basements can serve as illuminating points of entry into the times in which they were produced. So perhaps unsurprisingly, the calm, quiet exteriors of most encyclopedias mask what was very often a turbulent process of their creation. So when we look at encyclopedias of the past, we tend to presume the reliability and consistency of the information. The uniformity of the volumes is not only reassuring, but also an assertion of that encyclopedia's authority. We imagine that there's a central plan, a guiding vision, and often a single editor who shepherds the project from inception to completion. Encyclopedias cover an established and defined body of knowledge, and both instances have a clear beginning and a clear end to them. And I think it's not too much of a stretch to say that encyclopedias and other major reference works are themselves institutions. Think of the authority of Diderot's Encyclopedia as a symbol of the European Enlightenment, the German Brockhaus, the British Britannica, or the Oxford English Dictionary. By contrast, the Yiddish Encyclopedia, the Algemeine Encyclopedia, meaning the general encyclopedia, is best defined, if by anything, by its incoherence by its instability and by its ever-changing mission. This was on account of the rise of Nazism to power in Germany, the continual displacement of Yiddish-speaking Jewish intellectuals, artists, and activists, the shifting sands of Jewish diaspora politics, and changes in both the functional and symbolic roles of Yiddish. I'm just going to take a minute and I'm going to walk you through this image here, this, this sort of numbering system. So you can see there's volumes in Yiddish. So Quick primer uh, for anyone not familiar, but Yiddish is the language of European Jewry for most of the last thousand years or so. Like all Jewish languages, uh, it's written in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, but, this is, but Yiddish is a Germanic language, so at its core is Middle High German, so the German spoken about a thousand years ago with, it, with the incorporation of words from Hebrew, from Aramaic, and then as Yiddish speakers traveled from place to place, they incorporated words, I'm sorry, I'm moving around too much. They incorporated, you told me to stay still, uh, words from the surrounding society. So the Yiddish that's spoken in Jerusalem is very, filled, you know, very much filled with modern Hebrew. The Yiddish that's spoken in Brooklyn has lots of English and, and so on, right? Um, so what we have here is this very skinny volume all the way on the right is the first of what becomes two sample volumes. So these were produced at the very beginning of the project in order to attract subscribers to it. And I'm going to show you some images from it. And then we have five volumes here. You can see they're numbered one, two, three, four, five. And these are volumes that, as we'll see, contain general information. Um, they follow the Aleph base, as you can see. It begins with the letter Aleph here at the bottom. And then there's another set of volumes that start here that uh, follow the Hebrew alphabet. So Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalet, He, and so on, following basically A, B, C. So there's two different numbering systems. And then a four-volume set in English, one through four, called Jewish People Past and Present. I'm going to decode all of this. Um, but this is why it's such a fascinating uh, mystery um, for me. So what uh, my book does is tries to chart the history of what became ultimately one of the last collaborative efforts of a generation of Jews who came of age 
in the 1905 Russian Revolution. And in a way, it's an extension of my first book, which was my dissertation, The Revolutionary Roots of Modern Yiddish. And in that project, what I looked at is the first generation of Yiddish scholarly activists. This was a generation of Jewish activists who were born in the Russian Empire around the year 1880 or so, who grew up in an age of increasing modernization in Russia, also a time of heightened anti-Semitism within the empire. Among this generation, we find uh, many, if not most, of the leading political, cultural, and labor leaders of Eastern European Jewry for the first four decades of the 20th century. These activists were deeply involved in revolutionary activism in the empire. They were populists, nihilists, anarchists, socialists, communists, deeply committed to the working class. But they recognize that their worsening situation was not only an account of their class status, but they were also facing anti-Semitism at the same time from very often fellow workers. So they were looking for ideologies that would help respond to their economic situation, but also to this violence going on around this anti-Jewish violence. For um, Eastern European Jews, the Russian Revolution of 1905 was the, the, the revolution in which they really began to uh, invest their emancipatory hopes. It's estimated as many as a third of those arrested in the opening violence of uh, the October Revolution were, were Jews. With that revolution's failure in 1907, political avenues begin to be denied to, uh, to Russian Jews in particular. And for those who stay in the country, they begin to turn towards Yiddish cultural development and a set of ideologies promoting what came to be called diasporism, a term that's starting to, to make a little bit of a comeback. Uh, um, and what they argued for was that they wanted to, to exist as a national minority in the lands in which they resided. So they believed that they had the right to exist as a Yiddish-speaking community within the empire itself as a recognized minority. And they did this in contrast to other ideologies that were also beginning to make their way throughout uh, these Jewish communities. They were, in they were in opposition to assimilationists who wanted to, to keep at the task of finding a home within the empire on the basis of individual rights, who thought that Jews needed to sort of assimilate into the larger culture. They fought against emigrationists who were arguing that Jews should move to the new world and, and create a new home. And they were often arguing against Zionists who were organizing to build a Jewish home what was then Ottoman-controlled Palestine. For many of the first Yiddishists, what this meant was charting a path so they could live as Jews in the lands in which they found themselves, but rejecting the religious or assimilationist choices of previous generations. As a national minority, though, they wanted collective national rights. They were decidedly pro-diasporist, and what this meant was trying to find a path forward between Zionists on one side and Bolsheviks on the other, um, both of whom negated the Yiddish language, ultimately, with their, with their politics. And so what they saw as central to their task was elevating the status of the Yiddish language. Prior to their generation, there was very little recognition that Yiddish was a language sort of of equal weight and equal value to that of other European languages. It, it was considered a jargon by its own speakers. It was considered bad German, a dialect that had no rules to it, that had no established vocabulary or orthography. So what these activists did in the wake of the failure of the 1905 revolution, uh, many of them began to just throw themselves into Yiddish language activism. because This was permitted by the state but had its own revolutionary potential. And in doing so, what they, they laid the intellectual and often institutional groundwork for a Yiddish high culture, uh, for creating educational systems, research institutions, the Yiddish press, theater, later, radio, and film. And they did this through a number of early works. I'm just gonna show you a couple slides that are out of the first book. So this first one is Yiddish, uh, Yiddish Grammatic. So um, the, the, one of the very first Yiddish grammars, this is 1908 by Zalman Rezin, who seeks to uh, impose a grammar or pull a grammar somehow out of Yiddish. It's a little bit of both. 
right? Um, you have Alexander Harkavy in the United States who's beginning to publish some of the first dictionaries, multi-language dictionaries. So he produces a Hebrew, Yiddish, English dictionary. You can see the Hunt Werther Buch there. Um, so they're producing these reference works. They're also creating a, a new forms of literary criticism in Yiddish. So you have this famous journal, also 1908, Literarische Monatschriften, meaning literary uh, monthly. And it says Freie Biene for Literatur und Kunst, or the free stage for literature um, and art. You have another one, the Yiddische Welt. Um, that's from 1913, from Vilna. So these are all attempts to create this high culture to kind of prove to themselves, to prove to um, other Jews, and to really to prove to the world that the, the Yiddish-speaking Jews are, are a people, that they are a nation, and therefore they are deserving of their own place in the world. Perhaps their greatest accomplishment was this volume in, in this period called Der Pinkis, meaning sort of the record, uh, which was a yearbook for the history of Jewish literature and language for folklore, criticism, and bibliography. And so, this, so they begin creating scholarship in the Yiddish language as well. Really some of the first people to do this in a, a modern way. So these activists are busy, you know, from this time period of about 1907 until really the start of World War I with this project. Now, after World War I, of course, the whole sort of map of Europe has changed. There's no more Russian Empire, for example. And in the, 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 the Soviet Union, the, the, the place for Yiddish is much more complicated. Um, Yiddish begins to be sort of transformed into purposes to promote Bolshevik ideology. That kind of freedom and those possibilities begin to be limited. And so many of these activists flee the Soviet Union. They're not Bolsheviks. Some of them are tied to the Mensheviks or they're uh, union activists. And so they flee. And so the, the place that many of them flee to is Berlin, which becomes home to a massive community um, of, of Russians living abroad. And you have this period in Berlin in the 1920s and 1930s where you have tens of thousands of Yiddish speakers for the first time who are making their way to the, the, the city in the hopes of you know, finding a, a place where they can continue this cultural work. They, they go to Germany for a range of reasons. One of them is just purely economic because if you're working in Germany in the, the period of hyperinflation, but you're selling your products abroad, that means you're actually able to get an enormously like, favorable exchange rate if you can sell something in dollars or in zlotys or, or in pounds or in francs but convert those to marks, you're actually able to live off your work. And so you have this major movement of both Yiddish and Hebrew writers to Berlin in the 1920s. Um, by the end of the 1930s, how, I'm sorry, by the end of the 1920s, however, the number of Yiddishists who are still working in Berlin has diminished, and there's, but there's still this kind of this small, strong core of figures who are there. Now, among these Yiddish activists, their dream for so long was to create an encyclopedia. They had thought that the that encyclopedia was going to be the pinnacle of their cultural work and that every nation has a great encyclopedia. You know, and so in this way, although as much as they are, they are revolutionaries, they're still sort of wedded to this enlightenment vision of the encyclopedia, that encyclopedia is going to be encapsulate the knowledge of the world and that it is going to be the most um, sort of obvious and strongest articulation of their place among the nations um, of the world. So they begin to uh, work towards this goal of creating an encyclopedia. And indeed, it's a time period in which there's all sorts of Jewish encyclopedias that are being published or in the same vein. You have in the, the, the first major one in New York in 1901 soon followed by a Jewish encyclopedia in, in Russian, 1908, and then in Berlin in 1928. And what unifies all of these projects are not only that they were worked on by many of the same people, but they are Jewish encyclopedias, meaning the content is Jewish, but they're published in non-Jewish languages. So they are meant for an audience of both Jews and non-Jews, and it became a way for these 
encyclopedists to sort of present a vision of the Jewish people to the larger world that showed that Judaism and Jews themselves were compatible with the modern European order. These are phenomenal works. They're, they're complicated in all sorts of different ways. But what the Yiddishists wanted to do was to do something really quite different and quite opposite to this. And the, the key figures who were involved with this project at the early stage were all disciples in one way or another of this figure named Simon Dubnov, who was the first major historian to take Eastern European Jewry, the, the poor, the masses, the Yiddish speakers of Eastern Europe, to take them seriously as a subject for study, for historical research. He was a materialist, so he wasn't interested in you know, charting the, the Jewish spirit, but he looked, at, he looked at facts, at figures. He was a modern historian in that way. He, you know, he, he looked at data in, in, in a way that we perhaps would, would recognize. Um, he also had a vision of the Jewish people as firmly a diasporic people, but who moved from center to center. So he looked at you know, the, the original center of the Jewish people in Jerusalem, but then looked at how that center moved over time to, to, to Babylonia, to, to Spain, to Germany, to Russia. And he talked about Ju Judaism as having these different centers and insisted on Jews' right, again, to live as a people in the lands in which they find themselves. Now, around Dubnov were a, a variety of different figures. Most important to the project was Rafael Abramovich, who was probably in his time period the most famous of all these figures, but also, I think, kind of lost to history. He was the leader of the Mensheviks in exile. So the Mensheviks were those uh, communists who split with the Bolsheviks in 1903 and then became sworn enemies of Bolshevism, but strong communists themselves. You have other figures like the Jewish demographer Yakov Leschinsky, from whom we get actually the, the number six million. He did the first counting after the Holocaust. And Avram Rosen, um, who went by the pen name Benadir, who is a major figure in Jewish uh, diaspora politics. So these figures come together and they decide that to honor the 70th birthday of Dubnov, they finally want to make this long standing dream of an encyclopedia come true. But instead of following the models of their, their predecessors of having a Jewish encyclopedia in a non-Jewish language, they want to flip the script. And so what they want to do is to create a Yiddish language encyclopedia, but that contains knowledge of the world. So it's going to be an encyclopedia for Yiddish readers, but not give them knowledge about themselves, but to inform them about the larger world in which they inhabit. And they really saw this as a project that would exist sort of as a bridge to help Jews enter into that modern world. This, what I have here on the screen are the first of two, what becomes two different sample volumes. Remember that very skinny volume on the far right of that first image that I showed you. So this says Probeheft, which means a sample volume. Here's the title, Algemeine Encyclopedia, so general encyclopedia, general information. You can see Dubna Fund, Berlin, 1932. They actually published another one in January of 1933, also from Berlin, which is, of course, on the, the same month when Hitler comes to power. And what this sample volume uh, contains, it gives us the best look of how they imagined the project would uh, sort of take course had it been allowed to fulfill its original vision. So this is a short pamphlet. It's about 50, 60 pages or so. And it contains the kind of information that you would sort of expect in an encyclopedia. So I just have a couple images here. So it has images of, of dinosaurs here, like obviously maybe not really to proper scale. <laughs> images of like obelisks here. I'm happy to share these slides with anybody if you want, if it's easier for you. Um, this is my favorite one, um, Pesach Insel, so Passover Island, um, right? So e what we think is Easter Island, right, today. Pesach um, Insel. And so what is contained in the sample volume are, you know, there's, there's politics, there's culture, there's geography, you know, there's uh, mini biographies of, 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 you know, major figures. But there was this tension among the encyclopedists and among reviewers of this project who said, you know, what, what, Yiddish-speaking Jews need is actually a Jewish encyclopedia. They don't need knowledge of the world. So there was a fight that went on 
among the organizers from the very beginning about what sort of knowledge Jews needed. Did they need knowledge about themselves or did they need knowledge about the larger world? So what the editors finally decide to do is they, they agree on a compromise. Sometimes they talk about it as an 80-20 split. Sometimes they talk about it as a 70-30 split. What they say is that most of the volumes are going to contain general knowledge, but then there'll be a supplement at the end, sort of like a bonus volume for subscribers, that will be a Jewish encyclopedia that will contain sort of what we would expect to find in, in something that was more decidedly Jewish. So these are the debates that are going on in uh, the, this community of Yiddish speakers at the time. They're having fierce debates. It's getting played out in the Yiddish press. It's getting played out not just in the Yiddish press from, from Germany, but in, in Poland, in America, in different parts of the world. Because there's, there's just so many hopes that are invested into this project of what seems to us probably this fairly mundane thing of just an encyclopedia. But soon after that second edition of the sample volume comes out, Hitler comes to power. Now we are talking about Jews who are foreigners and they are leftists. So they represent a triple threat to the new regime and so they have to flee. The majority of them flee where most Germans try to flee to and they end up in Paris where they resuscitate the project and it takes them nearly two years. Um, these are people who are working on this encyclopedia sort of part time you know, Abramovich is, you know, mostly busy in fighting Stalin. You have Dubnov, who's busy working on his own history. You have Leschinsky and Benadir and so many others who are all doing other work as well, but they remain committed to this project. So it's only in late 1934 that the first volume finally appears. And you can see uh, it says Ersterban, it goes from uh, the letter Aleph to Atlantic City. And it contains much of what you would sort of expect in, in a Yiddish uh, language encyclopedia about the world. It contains um, articles about technology, about science, about major countries. It covers topics like Unterwasser ships, like submarines, and you know, all the kind of things. But it also has far more what we might think of as Jewish content than as advertised, perhaps. It begins uh, with a uh, full color uh, rendering of this famous uh, picture of Yirmiyahu, the prophet Jeremiah, by Lesser Uri, a famous uh, uh, painter uh, from Germany in the 1930s. Um, it contains full color maps of, of the world. So here, here you can see right, Europe, China, right, Russia, India, so on, all in the Yiddish language. In this, the arrival of this volume, now four years after it was first announced, so this is late 34, is met with enormous enthusiasm in the Yiddish press. So that the journal Literarische Blätter, which comes out of Warsaw, it was sort of the New Yorker for its time, dedicates an entire issue over to the encyclopedia because it's seen as such a great achievement for the Jewish people and a sign that Yiddish speaking Jews are finally sort of fully coming into their own as a people who should be taken seriously. It's also enough to generate enormous criticism. Um, so uh, from, I think this is from Moscow, um, so in the Soviet Union in the Yiddish press in a journal called Wissenschaft und Revolutia, Science and Revolution, uh, Beslutsky writes a piece that refers to it as a bourgeois clerical nationalistic encyclopedia under the mask of secularism, uh, political neutrality, and social consciousness. Right? And so it just, you know, you know, just writes it off you know, as, as this bourgeois project that sort of runs contrary to the ideals uh, of the revolution. And so it's, it's, it's become a thing, right? It's a thing that is being talked about. It's being embraced by the world. Uh, and so they begin putting out more volumes, and, but it's a slow project. At most, they can put out one volume a year. They, they're never able to raise the money they want for it. They're never able to fully kind of get this project to be self-sustaining. So they put out a volume in 1934. They put out a second volume in 1935. They put out a third volume in 1936. They're still on the first letter of the alphabet. Um, the, and I should say the letter Aleph, the first letter of the, the Yiddish alphabet, 
is about 25% of the total body of words in Yiddish. So, you know, it should be weighted, but um, they, they barely ever get out of, of all of as, as we'll see. But something interesting happens in the third volume that is published in 1936. At the very end of that volume, instead of having just another encyclopedia essay, they actually have a long essay on the history of anti-Semitism. And it's the first signal that something is changing with the content of the encyclopedia. Now, by the mid-1930s, you know, Nazism has been in power for several years. The, the levels of anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union and in Poland and in America, where there are large numbers of, of Yiddish readers, is escalating dramatically. Um, and so although this essay is sort of placed correctly in terms of the alphabet, it's out of place almost entirely in any other way. So it's not just one or two columns long, but it goes on for many, many pages and has many authors and gives really a full history of anti-Jewish thought. And then, uh, you know, uh, in the, the Middle Ages under uh, uh, Christian regimes in Europe, the transformation to biological forms of, of racism and talks about the recent violence of the period. In 1937, they put out another volume still in Aleph, which ends with Eretz Yisroel, the land of Israel. And they do the same thing. So it looks like a normal encyclopedia volume. But the last entry, as you can see here, says Eretz Yisroel, uh, Palestina, here, gives a long history of the relationship of Jews to the land of Israel, which is now under British occupation. right? And it talks about the, the biblical association. It talks about the modern Zionist movement. And for a group of Jews who are not Zionists, they're, they're really beginning to sort of recognize the importance of the, the, the growing Jewish community, sort of the parastate that is growing here to the larger Jewish world. Now, in 1938, the, nothing gets published for the encyclopedia. Um, there's just this year where, where nothing is published. But, of course, 1938 is the year in which the Nazi regime begins to turn really lethal. Right? So we have the, the three crises of the Anschluss, the taking of Austria, the Sudeten crisis, with taking parts of Czechoslovakia, and then Kristallnacht. So uh, as committed anti-fascists, most of the encyclopedias are very, very busy working with Jewish communities. <coughs> Rafael Abramovich, his son, Mark Rain, who had gone off to fight in the Spanish Civil War, is kidnapped by Soviet agents and ultimately executed by them. But he actually goes, takes time off, and goes to Spain to look for his son. Um, but at the same time, the World's Fair is in uh, Paris this year. And there's a Yiddish exposition there. And so they actually begin to entertain the idea of doing a French version of the encyclopedia. So they put out um, uh, an advertising document. I've only found one copy of this in an archive in Cape Town, South Africa. It's a whole other story. Um, but this never gets off the ground. But they put out these advertising documents. Finally, what they decide is that because of the worsening situation facing Jews by the late 1930s, they're going to shift course. And they're going to put out the supplement early, they decide. That supplement that they had agreed on at the beginning is sort of a compromise that was going to contain Jewish knowledge. And they say, we're not going to just do one supplement. We're going to put out two. So they announce that they're going to shift uh, the system. So it's no longer going to be one, two, three, four. So we're going to take a break. And we're going to put out Yidin, meaning Jews, Aleph, and Jews, base. Right. So two volumes dedicated to the topics of, of Jews. In 1939, the first of these comes out from Paris. And it's a beautiful volume. And because really, for, for many of these Yiddish, it's the first time that they're writing on things that they know, right? I mean, they don't know anything about you know, the crisis of homelessness, or they don't know anything about you know, architecture, necessarily. What they know is about Jews, right? And so th you have some really the, the, the best articles of the time period tracing the histories of Yiddish language, of Jewish education, of Hebrew literature of the, the sociological crises facing Jews at the time period. It's really this sort of this, this phenomenal set of volumes. So the first one comes out in the spring of 1939, right? So just before war breaks out. 
War breaks out, of course, in September of 1939, which means that for these Yiddishists who are in Paris, they are now cut off from their community in Poland, which is where the largest number of readers are, right? There's 3.3 million Jews in Poland, the vast majority of them Yiddish readers. That's where their subscribers are. So in the spring of 1940, when they're finally ready in April, to, when they publish Yidden Beis, the one place they have to send them is to America. So they ship this volume to America, and the ship is lost at sea, carrying all of the volumes. Likely sunk by a U-boat, but no, never been able to fully confirm this volume. But a few were sent by the regular mail um, through London to New York. And I was able to find one of these copies for $5 in a bookstore in New York once. Yeah, it's my most treasured possession um, of all my books, you know. And Yidden Base in particular is this phenomenal volume. At its center is this, this long essay on the history of Jewish art by uh, Rachel Wischnitzer Bernstein, whose, whose larger book on this topic was finally just published in English two years ago uh, by a press in Krakow, um, Symbols and Forms in Jewish Art. And within weeks of Yidden Beis being published, Western Europe is invaded by the Nazis. So once again, these Yiddishists who have fled the Soviet Union for Germany, who fled Germany for France, now have to flee France again. And they follow the sort of the usual route where they make their way to the south of France, they scramble for visas, and this is now late summer 1940, we're talking sort of August 1940. They get emergency permission to get into the United States. They make that perilous trek over the Pyrenees through Spain to Lisbon, and they're able to come to <coughs> the United States in very, very late summer 1940. So here's a telegram from 1940. Um, uh, August 30th, between Nochem Chenin and uh, Emanuel Pott. He says that Abramovich and six friends left Lisbon August 28th on the ship Excalibur. Entire Abramovich Zegelbaum group leaving September 3rd on the ship Nihilus. Mendelssohn wired everything satisfactorily, and on and on. Right? So they're able to get this permission, but it says we must raise necessary funds. Right? So there's this scramble among Jewish labor activists um, to bring these um, encyclopedias, to, to bring these, these, these figures to the United States. There's this brief period of sort of openness in American policy following the, the German invasion of Western Europe. So now the encyclopedias are in America. And they have to figure out, like, what's going to happen with this project? And so for the war years and for the Holocaust years, you know, they are uh, busy f uh, working on the encyclopedia, but also working to sort of figure out what those next steps are going to be while getting reports of the destruction of their, their communities and the, the, and the loss of all of their comrades, all of their colleagues and coworkers to the Holocaust itself. They manage in uh, late 1940 to republish Yidden Base. Um, they also announce that they're going to publish a third in that series of, of Yidin, Yidin Gimel, that they, they hope to publish soon. But ultimately, and I'm sort of skipping over a bit of, of history here, what they recognize is that in the post-war period, that they are going to be sort of the, the last holders of the knowledge of this culture that has just been destroyed. Right? So they have just squeaked out of Europe sort of at the very last minute. And they see that as some of the, the, the intellectual and political leaders of Eastern European Jewry, like they're, they're the last of their kind. And so in, o over many years, they come to recognize that there's sort of four post-war tasks that are so sort of essential to their mission. And they commit to keeping the encyclopedia going as a vessel for these various tasks. So they see that part of what they have to do is salvage the remnants of, of Yiddish culture. And what that means is they, they, they see themselves as having to take responsibility for all of the, the, the artifacts that have been left behind after these Jewish communities were destroyed. You know, the Nazis, when they went into different um, Jewish cities, Jewish towns, neighborhoods, 
would often collect the books, collect the volumes, uh, sometimes to destroy them, sometimes to display them. So when the Allies come, you know, they find themselves in charge of just literally millions and millions of volumes, many of them in Yiddish. So they recognize that they have to somehow take responsibility for, for rescuing the, these texts, a project that really goes on to, uh, to this present day. They also see themselves as responsible for placing the, these uh, Yiddish speakers who have now been scattered around the world as refugees from Nazism, of, of placing them in conversation with one another and, and getting them to uh, create a community. Because in the, the, the run-up to, to World War II, you have Yiddish-speaking Jews who were just scattered all over the world, right? So many came to America, but others came to Montevideo or to, to Melbourne or to Cape Town or to Buenos Aires or to Mexico City and, or, or to Havana. And they, they saw themselves as responsible for being the, the center for this extended network of Yiddish speakers. And they began to think about the possibilities of the encyclopedia as a volume to help um, connect all these different um, uh, Yiddish speakers with one another. They also saw, not surprisingly, that they had to take responsibility for documenting the Holocaust, the Yiddish word for which is churm. And they, they uh, as, as historians in particular, as disciples of Dubnov, who was murdered um, outside of, of Riga um, in uh, 1941, that they saw that they had this scholarly obligation to produce ultimately some of the first histories of what we now think of as the Holocaust. And then lastly, they also recognized that American Jewry was now going to have to occupy the position of being leaders of the Jewish world. That it was now the largest community uh, of Jews in the world. You know, the, the community in Palestine, then Israel after 48, was you know, very small and uncertain in those first decades. But that was American Jewry that was going to lead global Jewry. And so they, what they wanted to do was to use the encyclopedia as a means by which to provide a legacy to that community, which they saw as very, very new. I mean, it was celebrating its, what, 300th anniversary by that time period, but they kept talking about the new Jewish community in America. <coughs> so now by the, you know, the 1940s, these are no longer young men. They're, you know, in, they're in their 60s, uh, many of them, some even older. But they recommitted themselves to this task of continuing with this project. In 1950, they published uh, Dalit, so the fourth uh, in the Yidden series, where they have uh, uh, long essays on Jewish emigration. And so this shows uh, Jewish emigration to the Americas. So this is sort of global uh, migration. And then in black, you can see you know, the percentage of Jews, but the refugee situation of Jews around the world. And they also decide to publish uh, what becomes a four-volume set of the encyclopedia in English. And that's with these volumes, Jewish people, past and present. Now, like everything else with the encyclopedia, it was originally supposed to be just one volume, and ultimately it became four volumes. Um, and with these, which I'm sure there's copies of this in your library here, because they're everywhere. Um, what these volumes contain are some of the, the best works that appeared in Yiddish translated, but they also commissioned a whole series of new works as well, including new histories of Jews in the Americas, such as this very, very popular work um, that, that, that was widely circulated in the 1950s by Anita uh, Levison, Pilgrim People, and that really talked about the position of Jews you know, in the Americas. You know, so uh, you know, they have one volume of the Eden series that talks about Jews in, in Canada, uh, the United States, Mexico, throughout Latin America, and to South America as well. And then finally, the last two volumes of the encyclopedia are dedicated to the Nazi Holocaust. Now, unlike many of the single-authored works that were coming out at this time period, like by Raul Hilberg or Gerard uh, Reitlinger, uh, Leon Polyakov, and others, these two volumes, which are published um, in 1964 and 1966, are compendia of essays written by some of the most prominent uh, members of the surviving uh, countries. Um, 
or survivors from, from the countries that were, were impacted by the Holocaust. This contains something like 22 different essays, each of which contends with the situation in a different country. And what these volumes do is they, they, they um, sort of trace the, the history of the Jewish community and then the impact of, of Nazism uh, on, on those communities, the desecration uh, of the people and the objects and, and the culture, and then talk about you know, the, the afterlife of what happens. There's also a great focus on the question of resistance. They publish this, this map that then gets republished in many places throughout the Yiddish world because the, 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 the web of resistance here. And so you can see all the different sites here where there were, where there were actions of, of armed resistance. Um, <coughs> And these volumes were published in part with support from the Claims Commission, which was part of the reparations payments paid by uh, post-war uh, you know, West Germany to Jewish communities around the world. However, by the, the mid-1960s, the audience for this encyclopedia had diminished you know, utterly. There were very, very few people who uh, were still working in the Yiddish language. Yiddish in uh, New York and throughout the Americas was not a language that was being taught to younger generations. So the audience for these encyclopedias had just disappeared. And I'll just um, tell a quick story here, sort of as a, maybe as a way to end, that when I first began researching the Yiddish encyclopedia, I think it was in 2008, I gave a call to the Central Yiddish Cultural Organization, which at that time had an office above Union Square in New York. Um, and I, I talked to the director, Haim Wolf, and I said, hi, you know, I'm reaching, researching the Yiddish Encyclopedia. Um, do you have any files on it? Do you have anything I can look at? And he's like, you're researching the Yiddish Encyclopedia? He said, in nine years, that's how long he'd been directing, no one has ever asked about the Yiddish Encyclopedia. He said, come on over. My basement's full of them. I can't give them away. So I went to his basement, went over basement, and floor to ceiling were these two volumes. You can see how pristine these last two volumes are on uh, Vav and Zion. Uh, uh, you can see these volumes on the, um, on the Holocaust, really floor to ceiling in the basement. There was just no, there was just no audience for them. They, they published some 1,500 copies of each of these volumes. And, probably sold you know, in the dozens, maybe a hundred or, or more of them. Um, and so from the, the, the late 1960s onwards, this project just sort of sat. Um, and it was only sort of by almost serendipity that I, I kind of came to, to, under, to sort of understand the, the importance of it and began doing this research. And as I, as I hope I've made the case that Encyclopedias are far more than what you know, their, their covers kind of lend you to uh, believe that they contain and that within their pages, they can really chart the, you know, the, the, the history and turbulence of an entire people. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions or anything that, you, that people might have about this. Yeah. I thought it was fascinating because I heard a version kind of on Zoom right. a couple of years ago yeah. now and um, was so excited um, to invite you. So I hope everybody else found it really interesting. And I will be bringing around this microphone for Q&A because we need it for the live stream. So um, any questions? Thank you so much. It was really fascinating. And uh, it's amazing, I think, how do you how you speak to so many constituencies in the room, right? Um, some of us work in Europe, some of us work in the United States, and and points beyond. So there's something of interest to us all. Um, so I was I, I'm really embarrassed to say I haven't read your first book, and now I'm wholly motivated to go. To I wrote that book is my dissertation. It's okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm very much motivated to read it. Um, so I was intrigued by your your. Um, initial sort of prelude there where you said uh, that many of these future encyclopedists um, saw themselves as a national minority in the Russian Empire. 
And I think that's important to underscore, right? Because they're not really from Russia. They're from the Russian Empire. So I just did yep. some quick research. Shimon Dubnov is from Belarus, mm -hmm. right? Rafael Abramovich is from mm -hmm. Latvia. Yeah. And this uh, other person that I knew something about, um, but you can tell me more, Nahum Gergo, I'm probably mispronouncing Nahum, Gergo, yeah. his name horribly, is from, yeah. is from Ukraine. Yeah. So uh, how did they see themselves in relationship to other national minorities yeah. in the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, and how did they reflect, I suppose, on their homeland yeah. uh, of the 1930s? Uh, not in a historical sense, but what the Soviet Union had become. Obviously, they were politically motivated to do so as well, but I'm interested in how mm, the Soviet Union, in particular its national nationalities policy was written about, if at all, in the yeah. encyclopedia. And then lastly, if you would sure. indulge me uh, after you uh, uh, give me a response, um, if you could put up that map again of the world, because it's a strange map of the, the Russian Empire, that one of the first colored maps, it cuts off, you said Russia, but in fact, what is the, the, it's not uh, this pink, right? So oh, Ukraine so is yeah. not, you can see Crimea sticking down mm -hmm. there, much of, so it's divided. Can you maybe just as a prelude, you could tell me yeah. what how is the yeah, how is the Soviet Europa, Union yeah. being divided here? Yeah, that's a fine question. <laughs> <laughs> right, because the yellow yeah. is really all of it's Europe plus map. the European part, part of the Soviet. Not a political map. Yeah, yeah. That um, it's it it you know it's dividing you know sort of Europe into it's you know Asia and Europe uh -huh, as well uh -huh. here I think. Yeah. 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 Yes. Anyhow. Yeah. No, okay. I appreciate that. It says Asia, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it says yeah, yeah. The it's divided, yeah. But the map down below, yeah, you're right. It says Asia down below, which is why it's included in the volume, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 No, yeah, Aleph. Right. It's all in Aleph. They never. They do do get out of Aleph finally. They get to part way through the letter base. Um, but to answer your question, so you know, for. Almost all of these Jews, so they were born into this area known as the Pale of Settlements, right? You're familiar with them, sure. Right? These are the territories that are taken by Russia during the partition of Poland, you know, starting in the what, 1770s, going through the 1790s. So the, these territories that are between sort of Russia and you know, Germany, often that you know, later gets called the, the bloodlands, but includes you know, the Baltic states, Yellow Russia, Poland, Ukraine, Moldova, and so on. And so they are part of this territory. I don't have a map of the pale sort of handy, but the, that period from the 1790s really until you know, the, the breakup of the Russian Empire, the vast majority of Jews are not allowed to go into the Russian interior. You know, there's some exceptions for sort of wealthier, prestigious Jews. You can go to St. Petersburg or to Moscow. But most Jews have to stay in that territory, and, and really a new identity begins to emerge, right? So they're not living in and among Russians. They're living in and among Ukrainians and Poles and Latvians and Estonians and so on. But they look to Russian language and Russian culture as sort of their model for what a modern language and culture should be. But they're also facing oppression from Russian authority. So they're they, they all work in the Russian language. They don't really speak too many of the, the necessarily the languages of the societies around them, probably enough to get by. Um, but for them, like Russian is the, the, the standard you know, in many ways. Um, and so they, they see themselves as living in a diaspora. Like the question of homeland is not necessarily central to their idea of the nation. As diasporists, right, so they're committed to the idea of living in a diaspora, what they see is as providing that, that foundation for them is, in fact, Yiddish, is their language. And so what they do is they imbue the Yiddish language with all of these characteristics that really languages can't necessarily hold, right? So it's the language that's going to define uh, the boundaries of the nation. It's the language and its affiliated cultures that are going to uh, uh, locate them sort of historically uh, 
in a diasporic space of Eastern Europe. But what it also does is it allows them to move, right? And so they can pick up and they can take that language and bring it to other places where they're, they're not sort of forced to be in one place, right? And this goes back to that Dubnovian model that Jewish centers are always shifting and Jews are sort of always moving. And that is not an error that needs to be corrected, but it's a political situation that needs to be uh, sort of inscribed into law. And that as a national minority, Jews should have the same rights as other national minorities. So they are looking very consciously at what, say, Ukrainians are doing in this period, right? So, you know, by the 1870s, 1880s, you know, Ukrainians are, you know, insisting on the, the, uh, the, the distinguishing characteristics of their language and their own history and culture and so on. They're looking at these different nationalist movements of, of Poles and Czechs and others and using those as models for themselves, but absent the land, right? Absent the land. And so what they have to do is they have to take this language, which is kind of like, you know, it's the language of the street, it's the language, you know, of sort of day-to-day -day people, and they see that their task is to elevate it, right? So that it can express the full range of human experience. The Zionists are sort of doing the same thing, but in reverse, they're taking this language that exists in these very high spaces, and they have to figure out how do we make that language applicable to everyday speech? So they're, they're trying, there's this leveling of the two languages that's going on, often by the same people who are kind of bouncing back and forth between many of these different ideologies. But I don't know if that an gets yeah, towards does, an answer. Does. The Soviets have it because you're you have a Soviet critique of yes. the encyclopedia. Yes. So the Soviets have a competing project of Yiddishization. They do right yeah. that is supported in particular by non-Russian communists in Belarus and mm -hmm. Ukraine. Yep. So did they have a particular uh, vantage point? Yeah, on, on absolutely. That? And so some of these encyclopedists end up making their way to the Soviet Union, right? So there's there's this movement from Berlin back into the Soviet Union in the mid-1920s because the Soviet Union is actually putting money, like state money, towards these projects, right? Uh, they're promoting Yiddish schools, Yiddish universities, Yiddish research centers in, you know, in Minsk, in Kiev, and other places. Um, like there's this real possibility, but what all these figures who go um, east realize is that ultimately the only thing they're allowed to express is you know, the shifting Soviet ideology in the Yiddish language. So most famously, Nochem Stift, this figure who I wrote a chapter on in my first book, is the figure who writes the document that leads to the creation of the YIVO, the Yiddish Institute that's now in New York. Uh, but before that's even off the ground, he's back in Kiev working for, uh, a, a, as a philologist for a Yiddish institution and ultimately just dies at his desk on like uh, 1933 on the eve of Passover just from like exhaustion and just being trapped and seeing, you know, some of his superiors having been executed for falling off the party line and realizing he just has no future there. A lot of people were dying in 1933. A lot of people were dying in 1933. Yeah, thank you. Other questions. I'm keep my answer shorter than that. <laughs> Other questions. Yes. Hi. I don't know. So you talked about like the first counting like earlier. Do you know like how they went about that and like what time period that they started like counting and like kind of like how they did it? Oh yeah. So this figure Yakov Leschinsky. So he was what we might think of as one of the first demographers of European Jewry. So already starting in the 1890s, when he was like your age, in like his late teens, early 20s, he's already doing this statistical analysis like of his hometown and just seeing, you know, who's leaving and who's staying and kind of why. Um, and so he, for most of his career, had just spent his time counting, right? And so prior to the Holocaust, he was the person probably most in the world who had the clearest vision of how many Jews were in Europe. And so in the aftermath, he does all that statistical work, you know, combing through records and reports 
um, both um, that are published in, in newspapers, but also government documents. And he's the one who first gives us the number of six million, which then kind of takes off, right, as kind of the, the symbol. Um, but he, he, he does that really precise counting, and he does it pretty early. So like 47, 48, he's already doing that and giving us that number. A couple years uh, of really trying to figure out. Um, but then that number takes, of course, on this large symbolic value as well. Thank you for that. Other questions? Thank you so much. Sure. I've, I've, I've worked on um, glossaries that are included in um, books written after the Holocaust and and just seeing how rich kind of a dry source can be. And so yeah. seeing you unfold how, what a rich source an encyclopedia can be, <laughs> it's much more um, interesting than glossaries. But so um, my question is about the two volumes you mentioned towards the end in the Jewish people past and present, yeah. and that they include um, texts about the Holocaust, but that they didn't reach a wider audience. Oh, yeah. So um, just the, these last two volumes yeah, here? Yeah, those. And I was wondering if you could just give us some insights into what types of texts yeah, um, so are included. And and then broadly in the encyclopedia, I'm also interested in text image um, design and you know, who are their illustrators. I was surprised that there are colored maps and colored yes. images. So yeah. if you could shed more light yeah. on that. So, yeah, so let me talk about this image here first. So this is the symbol of the, the encyclopedia. So here it says, here's um, the ayin from, from Algamena and the ala for encyclopedia. And then, and I, I just spent a lot of time like staring at this, right? So it's obviously super stylized. But then you can see like very early on, right? So it brings together like industry and agriculture here, right? So they're very, very conscious kind of at the outset, I think, about what kind of encyclopedia this is. Like, there's nothing Jewish about this other than the alphabet, right? I mean, that, of course, makes it very Jewish in a way. But like to Jews, that's incidental. That's just like looking at, you know, two letters of the alphabet. What, you know, so this sends this message that this is very much about sort of science and technology and industry and productivism. Right, so it's about being a productive, sort of useful people, and that this encyclopedia will be something that will help the productivity of European Jews, in part. And so I think it's a really powerful symbol. It doesn't necessarily represent ultimately what the contents are, though. I think. Um, so I'll tell you that a lot of the images are just stolen. Um, they are just lifted from other encyclopedias. Maybe they had permission, maybe they didn't. I mean, one of the pieces I didn't really get a chance to talk about is the, is the sort of the archival challenges of this project. Because they're always in flight, you know, they're, they're not taking the records with them too often, you know? So when they, they flee Germany, they take some of the administrative documents, but they have, have to leave a lot behind when they flee Paris, you know? They, they grab what they can. Mostly they grab the manuscripts uh, for future volumes and they leave everything else behind. So I don't have those records, right? Which is why you know, I went to Cape Town because there was literally one folder of material uh, by a traveling salesman for the encyclopedias, the famous assassin Sholem Schwartzbard, um, um, who killed the Ukrainian pogromist Petit Laura in the 20s. He becomes a traveling salesman for the encyclopedia and dies apparently in his lover's bed in, in Cape Town uh, after being there for a month. And so those records ended up at the University of Cape Town and it's just there in the library. And so that's how I found they were going to try to do this volume in Paris because otherwise there's just no record to it, right? Um, but what, what we do see in the correspondence is just all throughout they're just talking about how poor they are and how they don't even have enough money to buy copies of other encyclopedias that they can use as reference. And they just have to go back and forth to the library, basically to copy the entries. And like, if I was to do another book on this, which I'm not, but if I was, it would be just to compare the entries for non-Jewish topics to other encyclopedias. And I'm guessing everything's just either a one-to-one -one correspondence or 
quickly paraphrased, right? Because they don't know anything about these topics. Um, it's not their field, you know, and they're hiring people to write different pieces. Um, but it's true, to get to your answer, it's true for a lot of the images as well, is that they're lifting existing images from other works and republishing them. And my sense is they're being very fast and loose with the permissions. Yeah. But when it gets to like the work of like Rachel Vishnitzer, so, like, I think there's enormous curation that is done with the images because she her her husband Mark um, who was a Yiddish uh, or in a Jewish cultural activist he was on the staff of the encyclopedia and I think she worked very closely with them to design those plates that are there those are full color plates that are included in those volumes as well yeah. but you had a question about the last two volumes right yeah. Yeah. and the contents so just sort of very quickly um, you know here so that's these two volumes here. Um, th these are utterly fascinating sort of surveys of the experience of Jews in each of, I think it's the 22 countries that were affected by the Holocaust in Europe. And so they have um, survivors from each of those communities. Very often, you know, so like the grand rabbi or major figures from those communities writing about those histories. So it's very much kind of an insider's perspective. And why that's important in, in part is because it's at this same moment that the, the first major histories of the Holocaust are being written in non-Jewish languages. And they're almost entirely about perpetration. It's like Raul Hilberg's famous, right? 61, The Destruction of European Jews, um, is all about the perpetrators, right? And, you know, Jews come off very, very poorly. Interestingly, though, he's a reader. He's thanked in these volumes as having read the manuscripts because the person who edited them was Philip Friedman, who was on Hilberg's dissertation committee at Columbia. And so there's this, this intertwining with all of these, these figures, right? Um, yes. So you talked about like the Enlightenment era and how the principles of knowledge kind yeah. of influenced their work. Is there a reason why um, it took like that extra hundred years or so um, <laughs> before kind of these works yes. were published after the Enlightenment era? Yeah. So so I appreciate that question a lot. Like why did it take so long? I mean, some of it took so long because it wasn't until really the 1860s, 1870s that speakers of Yiddish began to recognize that what they were speaking was a language. You know, prior to that time period, Yiddish was something you had to leave behind as a language in order to be successful in the modern world. But it's only after a whole series of sort of historical processes, but much of that having to do with anti-Jewish violence and sort of the recognition by many Jews that they weren't going to be able to find a place for themselves within the Russian Empire on, on those terms, that they began to look inward and began to recognize that what they need to do was to take this jargon they were speaking and to really craft it into a, a language. The other thing, though, is that ideas about encyclopedias have you know, shifted you know, far away from that original vision of Diderot, right? So, I mean, that, those first encyclopedias, you know, some of them take 100 years to complete. They're like, I think Diderot is 167 volumes. That by the time the first one's published, or the last one's published, the knowledge in the first ones is like completely out of date. So publishing around encyclopedias had shifted dramatically in that period to, to produce less sort of scholarly ones and more popular ones, ones that could, you know, could be uh, that you know, sort of middle class people could actually afford. You know, they wanted to target this at a price point of five US dollars for each one, which is pretty high at the time period, but within reach to hopefully a wide enough number of people. So it took uh, changes in printing technology and then also conceptions about encyclopedias, um, about, you know, about what kind of encyclopedias do people actually want and need. Encyclopedias were both becoming more sort of popularized in these kind of short uh, encyclopedias, meaning, you know, eight to ten volumes, but they were also becoming much more specialized. And so 
you're, you're, you're starting to find by the 1910s and 20s uh, specialized encyclopedias that are about you know, particular occupations or particular uh, areas of science and technology. These large projects that tend to, that sort of present, that kind of contain all the knowledge of the world, those are actually falling away um, to these more specialized or popular encyclopedias. Questions? I don't know. I keep thinking of a lot of different things as as all of the discussions are happening. And the first question I had had kind of as you were talking in the first place, which is um, which maybe you already mainly answered uh, was about how they decided what not to include. Yeah. And I mean, you talked about them looking at, but especially it's, it's, uh, I don't know, really jumps out with the Atlantic city, yeah. you know, like Atlantic city, these, a bunch of Eastern European yeah, exactly. Jews, like, why is it? I know they come to the United States, but I actually I can't remember. I guess that's towards the end. Are they already in the U S when they get to, to Atlantic but, city? No, that's the very first one. <laughs> right. So Olive to Atlantic city. And what happens? Oh, is oh, that's the, actually the, yeah. yeah. So the first four of these are on general knowledge. This, this is 34, 35, 36, 37. This one only comes out in America in 43, and mostly because they have the work already done. But after this time period, and I didn't mention this, but should have, they recognize that by the, by the end of the war, there's no need for a general encyclopedia in the Yiddish language anymore. There's not an audience for that. There's, there's not a, a need for it in the same way. There's not a sort of a working class of Yiddish speakers who need access to this. They recognize that linguistically American Jews are not passing on the Yiddish language to their children, that the future of Yiddish is really uncertain. So instead they focus all of their efforts moving forward on the Yiddish speakers who are already there, right? And trying to care for them, which is why that by the time those last two volumes come out, like there's so few Yiddish speakers left that there's really nobody to buy it anymore. But yeah, and you kind of also answered it when I when you answered about like losing a lot of the documents. So I wonder how much you know about like their internal conversations about we chose, you know, chose this over that. yeah, these. Yeah, so I have some of that information, but a lot of that is just gone, unfortunately. You know, what, what, what's interesting is where you can see the, the biases and the interests of the editors. So in one of these early volumes, I forget if it's number two or three, because of... Um, Abramovich's, um, you know, his connections to the Jewish working class movement, like a, a third, I think, of one of these volumes is given over to the different socialist internationals. Like, you know, the first international, the second, the second and a half international, the third international. Like there's these very long essays about it, which seems like ridiculous, right? In some ways, but it's like, that's what they know. That's what they care about. That's what they want to get across, right? Um, and so they're constantly shifting and changing the contents of the encyclopedia to sort of match the conditions in which they're writing. So it's very much kind of this warped reflection of the moment, each individual volume. And I'll say this volume here that's still in the original slipcase is one of those very few original Yidden base volumes that uh, were published just on the eve of Germany's assault on Western Europe that were sent through the regular mail. Um, so this is like, this is the copies that I have. This is ones on loan from a library. So I didn't have that one, but yeah. But otherwise, these are all first editions of each volume. I'll ask one more question yeah. uh, since people were quiet and then I'll open it up again. Um, so those last two volumes yeah. um, that were about the Holocaust in the different areas, what it reminds me of is the Yisker Bucher. Exactly. So the question yeah. is, what's the relationship between that and the yeah. Yisker Bucher? And also because, you know, you kept talking, I mean, Philip Friedman and Raoul Helberger in these, right? There's yeah. so many linkages. Are, were there linkages or, you know? Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's two ways I want to answer that. One is that like, Nearly every major, I don't know, maybe that's an overstatement, but so many of the major Yiddish or and Jewish intellectuals of the 20th century, that time period, contributed to these volumes. Like, so Salo Baron, Gershom Sholem, um, who else? Uh, Cloud Levi Strauss contributes to these volumes in different ways. Like, you can see the fingerprints of Walter Benjamin and others in, in these volumes. They, you know, they contribute. Uh, one, especially after it becomes volume on Yidden in particular. Uh, 
Um, but these, the, the, these later volumes on, on the Holocaust are in many ways like the, the first assertion by Yiddish speakers of trying to represent what the Holocaust was for them. Because of course, as we know, like five out of six uh, of every one of those murdered in the Holocaust was a Yiddish speaker, right? I mean, five of the six million. Were. And so it's, this is their attempt to try to get their understanding of that history out to the world. But it's really for them. You know, so it very much follows that line. I really think of those last volumes as sort of an extended uh, Yischer Buch um, in, in ways that they're, they're creating this, this archive of their own demise in a way. They're on each, they're by country. Okay, by, so it's, you know, each <laughs> one is like, you know, the Holocaust in Ukraine or the Holocaust okay. in Estonia, the Holocaust in Latvia. And so trying to just give kind of an overview okay, response thank you. to it. Yeah. And I think maybe some of the students don't know what Yisker books are. Yeah, so oh, yeah. definition? What's a Yisker book? Yeah, so <laughs> Yisker Bicher were these memorial volumes that were created in the decades after World War II by surviving members of different towns, villages, or cities. And there's hundreds of these that, that were produced. And so many of them were either by survivors of the Holocaust or even more often by people who were able to flee ahead of time. And so you have networks of people who are all from the same town or the same village who know one another, they remain in contact. And so what they do is they pool their, their, their knowledge with one another. They pool their, their, their photos, their stories, their memories, often letters, and they produce these memorial volumes, sometimes just in the hundreds, sometimes in the thousands, and then distribute them back to members of the community so that you have this memorial, this memorial book, that's what the term means, to these destroyed communities. And it was this, this very often unorganized uh, response by these communities. There wasn't like this one central group that was putting this all together. It just became this phenomenon that, that sort of took hold as a way to preserve this history for generations. They often exist in a multitude of, of languages. They're in, they're in Yiddish, they're, they're in Hebrew, they're very often in, in, in Polish or Ukrainian, depending on the other language. Um, to just have this testimony. And I'm guessing your library has many too. They're just scattered in all sorts of places. From a ruined garden, the Jack Kugelmas, the Jonathan Bayard. Yeah. Yeah. Are, they may include what happened during the Holocaust, but they're more about the life in that place before. Exactly. And yeah. but, and but what often about the, they have necrologies as well. Yeah. In them. And the articles in those two volumes are more about the Holocaust, true or not? Yes, true? they're yeah. they're much more so about the Holocaust itself, but they also talk about the community that was okay. destroyed. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and it's very much from the the victim perspective as opposed to perpetrator perspective. In the absence of other questions, I'm having dinner with you, so, okay. <laughs> so I will I'll ask many more. Go, uh, <laughs> but uh, just for the sake of my students, some of whom are here, I teach history of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. I call it history of Soviet Union, Russia, and Ukraine because I think we need to actually mm -hmm. talk about these places as well. But um, we read a, a memoir uh, early in the semester by a Latvian Bolshevik who, who published under the name Edward Dune, but his real name was Edvard Dunis. Um, and he ends up in Paris uh, after the war, mm -hmm. uh, writing for Menshevik newspaper. Oh, uh, um, and so I'm wondering, that's who I was thinking yeah, of yeah, in yeah. a way, like uh, about the contributors to these volumes. Yeah. Um, how many of them are There's Menshevik yeah. uh, and other sort of political refugees from the Russian Empire, yes. and is it a paycheck for them it as is, well? It is to exactly just, that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So for, I mean, th this encyclopedia served many functions, and one of them was just a way to get income to people, right? And so a lot of the early contributors are Mensheviks, and so they're writing pieces, usually in Russian, that are then translated into Yiddish, just so they can get money to them. And so um, early on in the project, I sat with that book, um, From the Other Shore, who, you, I'm sure you know this book, about the Mensheviks abroad. Mm -hmm. 
and just looked at all of the names and compared them to the names of the encyclopedias. And there's just so much overlap between the two, mostly because of Abramovich, who was just trying to farm out assignments right, to his comrades who were in exile, just trying to get them a little money. Yeah. But the truth is, there was very little money to, to send around, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank you. Thank you.